like whatever it is from request A to request B, we must use a cookie. Right? So anytime we want to persist information across multiple HTTP requests, use a cookie. So yeah, right. So effective base In a sense, yeah. So HTTP itself is not stateful. So it's not quite correct to say that. Cookies add statefulness to HTTP. <laughs> It's a way of storing a very old bit of data across multiple ways. This is not a problem if you build desktop applications or applications that only deal with mobile applications. You want to store some piece of state, stick it in a variable in your memory. Big deal. No problem. HTTP just doesn't have a way to do that. So, Cool. Any other questions before we get started on, like, um, on using Passport? Uh, so all this material is on our GitHub page, OK Coders. Session access control class and then uh, session access, right? A little bit. So, uh, we're going to use to handle user sessions. We've already got the authentication part done signing in, logging in, emails and passwords, encrypting, comparing hash passwords, so forth. Now we need to get this tracking part done and then the access control. Passport provides a means to handle sessions for us. That is what we are going to use it primarily for. But Passport describes itself as uh, a way to handle multiple authentication strategies. That's really what it's used for. And authentication is a way of identifying a person on your site. So our authentication strategy is email and password. Uh, and passport, uh, passport calls it a local authentication strategy. But you've seen websites where you go to log in or sign up the first time, and they say, log in with Facebook or log in with Twitter. Those are also authentication strategies. You are identifying yourself to that site through Twitter or through Facebook or even through GitHub. There are m dozens of ways uh, to do authentication on the web, right? Um, we are just using an email and password strategy. Because we've already been working, that's what we coded up on Monday, we are going to bypass Passport's authentication strategies stuff. And that's really what it's primarily used for. It's meant to, to make that stuff easy. But we already have that working, right? So instead, what we're going to focus on is taking advantage of Passport's ability to also track that session, to also manage that session for us. Okay? Rather than us doing like what Wayland was doing, where we're inspecting those cookies themselves in our code, or where we're dealing with session variables directly, or where we're manually managing this database connection between random strings of characters and a user ID, we're going to let Passport do that for us. We provide a couple of facilities. You know, we got to do some stuff that Passport wants us to do, but otherwise it takes care of the heavy lifting. And then Passport will make it very easy for us to see who's logged in and what kind of privileges they have, like if they're administrator or not. So, uh, so that's what we're going to focus on. And again, I'm building off this project that we've kind of already got going up here. Remember, we have our users page. We can sign up. We can log in. We can kind of fake log out, but it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, if we're in our project folder, which is where I am right now, you know I need to start up my database with MongoD and point it at the DB path DB. And then I need to, in another tab, start my server. And if everything is working OK, I should be able to visit my page, see my posts, go to a new post, and it, you know, there it is. It's going to let me create a post. This is what we want to prevent from happening. Great, I can log in. Now how do I prevent some person who is not logged in and who is not an administrator from getting to this page? Right? That's our goal in using sessions. OK, so I'm going to kill the server. First thing I want to do is install Passport. Passport to node module, so I use npm install. Right? And I'm going to save it so that it gets stored in that package.json file. So I do npm install Passport, dash dash save. And there we go, Passport. First thing that we're going to do is configure Passport for our application. So this is a process that we've already gone through for all of the other um, middleware, Passport functions as middleware that we're using. I look at my app.js file, and I go, OK, I've got a require in Passport here somewhere. right? So at the top, I'm going to add a var Passport. Let's require Passport. I'm also going to require in my user model, because uh, it turns out that we're going to use that to help Passport 
serialize the user. And I'm going to talk about what that means in just a second. For now, let me just go ahead and get that in there. Var user equals. We know that our user is located in our uh, models directory, right? So models, there it is, user.js. So I say require. And like I'm doing for my custom requires here, I start it with a dot forward slash, which is the directory I'm in. We know that from the command line. Routes, uh, excuse me, models, user, right? And now I've got access to that mongoose user object that does things, OK? All right. Then I'm going to configure Passport. I need to, like I have all of these other use statements, tell my application to use the Passport middleware. So Passport's going to do some stuff in between the HTTP requests coming in and my application code. What's it going to do? It's going to see if there's a cookie in there. Of course, I need, to like, I need to get that process in there. I must initialize or tell my application to use Passport after I've activated the cookie parser in the session. Passport depends on these things. It's sort of like Wayland sort of indicated. Passport is going to use this stuff, so these things must be activated. This is like putting our method override after the body parser, if you remember. We need to see what's in the body first before we can tell if there's a hidden form field. Same thing with Passport. We need to see what the session actually says before we can um, like use it to do stuff. So anywhere after this call to app.use cookie parser and app.use session, I can say app.use. Passport.initialize, and then app.use, passport.session. How do I know this? Documentation, right? So if I search for Express Passport on Google, uh, which is not at all what I wanted. <laughs> Express.js Passport? Yeah, there we go. So I'm uh, passportjs.org. There it is. There's a guide and with information about how I do this, like authenticating, configuring, and so forth. I actually find this guide to be rather confusing. Um, I think the documentation would be improved. Maybe I shouldn't do that myself because it's all open source. Um, but uh, it sort of shows you how to set things up, get configured, you know, this kind of stuff and so on. So exactly what we're doing here. Always, always, always check out the documentation, even if it is confusing, because it's better than not having any documentation. All right, what we need to do, Passport needs our help. Ultimately, we're taking a user and somehow sending a cookie back to the browser that is associated with that user. We can't just send the user. The user is an instance of our mongoose object, right? And the browser doesn't know what a mongoose object is. It just knows what a cookie is. It just knows what text is. So we need a way to translate between our user object that is signed in and that logs in and is what we're storing in our database on our system and the data inside of that browser cookie. If you're into the math, you can think of this as a function that maps from, one, from an input to an output, from one domain to another, right? We need a way to go from our mongoose user object to the data we're going to put in the cookie and then back the data that we put in the cookie to an actual user object, right? And Passport is going to do that uh, or handle the process of running that, uh, uh, executing that mapping function for us, but we still need to provide it that function. We still need to tell it what to put in the cookie and what we want out of it, right? Um, and what we're going to do, uh, this is called serialization. We're turning an in-memory object into some kind of text-based representation that can be persisted somewhere, namely our mongoose object into a cookie, right? This is called serialization. We need to serialize from the user to the cookie and deserialize from the cookie to the user. We are going to make that association, make that mapping using the user ID. So we're going to take our user object and give Passport its ID. And its ID is going to be associated with the cookie. And then when the request comes back to our server and we see that cookie in there, Passport is going to pull out the ID give it to us and say, here's an ID, what do you want to do with it? And we're going to turn it back into a user. And then request, excuse me, Passport, is going to make that user available on every request object in all of our route handlers, that req thing that we use everywhere. We will actually have an req.user, which is an instance of our mongoose user, available to us anywhere once that user has logged in, right? Um, and so it turns out this works really well. We just have to provide this mapping function. We do that after configuring Passport. 
and we want to call passport.serialize to do the mapping and passport.deserialize to do the unmapping, right? Our serialization function, our serialize is going to take a function callback, so this serialize function is going to call our function with a user and done, which is itself a method, and we just call done, null means no error occurred, passing it the user ID. And that's it. This is like middleware that will handle taking a user and turning it into user ID. Okay. And then in deserialize, we provided a function as well that takes in the ID or really any bit of text, whatever, and then a done function again. Done is like next in all of this middleware. And then now, we need to convert that ID into a user. How do we do that? This is why we incorporated that user model. This is a mongoose user object. So I can say user, oh, that's not how I do it. I would say user dot find by ID, which is a mongoose function that we know from the mongoose documentation that we're using in other places. In fact, when the user logs in, we use this to find them by their email. We do find by, you know, uh, find first or pass email, but this is a mongoose function. Find by ID, I give it the ID, give it a function callback that takes an error handler and the user itself. If I got an error, I should just call done and give it an error instead of null. If I got the user, I should give it null for the error and then the user. The thing is, error will be null if we got a user back. So I can just say done error user. And that's it. Again, how do like how in the world do I know to do this? This is on uh, the passport documentation, right? So I read their documentation. I go, okay, well, let's digest that and then make it the best sense of it that we can. But this bit of function right here, these two guys are what's going to make it work so that almost transparently a user is just going to appear as a user object that we are already familiar with anytime they log in, right? Almost without us having to do anything else. So, and that's pretty cool. This is very nice. Otherwise, we're like writing some crazy cookie code. We're dealing with databases and in-memory management and uh, lots of other nasty stuff. Whereas here, nope, we just say use a user ID for the cookie. Now let me turn it into a user. So, um, serialization will occur when the user logs in. It's going to be that bit that first sets the data that's going to get sent back to the uh, browser in the cookie. Deserialization will then occur every single time that browser makes a new request to the server. It will, every single time, get that piece of data from that cookie and turn it into a real user. So that means we're hitting the database every time a new request hits our application, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, an unfortunate necessity. All right, so let's make sure that I didn't totally botch that code up by running our server. It looks like I did do something wrong here. Passport.serialize, authenticator has no method. Serialize, and I'm going to spell it. Serialize user, thank you. And then probably deserialize user as well. That's why you read the documentation. All right, so let's try that again. That looks good. I should still be able to visit my web page, um, but nothing's really changed. For some reason, my camera is on, which means Google Hangout is not screen sharing. Sorry about that, guys. That was my bad. This time, that actually was my bad. All right. Great. So that worked, even though it's not apparently actually doing anything yet, right? Let's log in our user. Let's get our user associated with a session. Now, like I say, normally, we're gonna, we would use a passport strategy for this. We're skipping that part. We already have our strategy. We're just going to use the strategy that we've got. It's when a user goes to log in, and we authenticate them via their email and password. Yeah? We would just move this code into a passport function, but again, we're going to skip that. And instead, we're going to get to this point right here where it goes, hey, it worked. You're logged in. What can I do at this point? I can now associate this user that I got back user with a session, right? And somehow it's going to get serialized into its user ID. Request provides a method. I'm sorry. Passport uh, provides a method that will do that on the request object. Okay? So after I find it, I make sure there's no errors. I make sure the user is real and, there's no, and it has a valid password. At this point, rather than just immediately redirecting them to posts, I'm going to say request. Uh, login. 
this, this login function is something that Passport adds to the request object. And then I can just pass it the user that I get back from my mongoose command, find, by, you know, find one by its email address, and a function handler that returns an error if something went terribly wrong, like the cookies are disabled in the browser or something. If I get an error, uh, there's a couple ways to handle this. We can do the next thing that Maya was talking about last time, but here I'm just going to render 500, which is really not the best way to handle that. And then otherwise, I'm going to do exactly what I was doing before. Just redirect. Okay. So I'm not really changing anything except for calling this login function that Passport provides. When I do that, Passport is going to run this serialized user code and turn that user into its user ID, and that is going to get stuck in a cookie and associated over a session. So that now, when that user visits another page, it's going to get natively converted into a normal user that's going to be available on the request object. Let me ask you this. When you go back to the flash function, okay. Mm -hmm. you could theoretically flash their name. Like you could add in the, because we know oh, yeah. who they are. You sure, could, you could say. flash their email, because we have their email stored yep. with them. Okay. That's right. All right. Absolutely. And sure. that's the purpose of a cookie. Uh, to flash their net, like that way to... That's so what that we we're using what, it for. Yeah, we're, we're right? using it for, here in this context. That's right. Okay. Uh, and even more correctly would be to say that's the purpose of a session. A session, okay. Right? The session is this whole process of actually associating a user with cookie data. Okay. So, yep. That's right, because we have user, so we can do... Um, and in fact, we're going to do stuff with user every time somebody tries to access a web page, right? So we're going to see that in just a second. Now, I can run my application again restart it, visit the site, and go in and maybe log in, right? So I go to uh, users, log in. Great, I'm going to log in. That worked. It says I'm logged in. Fantastic. But nowhere, anywhere in my application am I actually checking if somebody is logged in. Yeah? It just it seems that I've logged in. Great. But I'm not looking anywhere to see if I've logged in. So I'm actually not an administrator but I can still go to get a new post. Like, ah, okay, that's not really what we want. We need a way of now knowing the fact that I'm logged in and controlling our code in that manner, uh, or, or uh, depending on who's logged in, what my privileges are. And like I was saying, request, I'm sorry, passport, is going to add a user object to the request object that is available in every single one of our router handlers, right? So if I open up my post routes, so I'm going to go to routes, open up posts, and I'm going to get my index right here. And I'm going to console.log request.user, which Passport is providing, right? Passport provides this user object on request. I'm going to save this and restart. Restarting automatically kills any cookies that are associated or any sessions that are associated with a particular user because they're in memory, and I just wiped all the memory uh, by restarting the application. So I'm going to go to the main post page, right? And if I look at the console, I'll see that undefined was logged to the console. That's because request.user is undefined. Nobody's logged in. Now I'm going to log in at users. In my normal fill it, fill it out on net with test login, it's automatically redirecting to my index page, right, for posts. So if I look at the console, now that user object is being logged to it. Where is this user object coming from? Well, it's on request.user. It's this guy right here. How does it get put on request.user? The passport middleware deserialized is being called, seeing that ID inside of the cookie, asking me what I want to do with it, and I'm saying, hey, Mongoose, go find that user, get it to me, and call this done function. And then Passport knows that when done gets called with that user, it should put that user on the request object inside the rest of my routes. And now it's available anywhere in my application. Right? That's pretty nice. This would be a lot harder to do if we were managing all of this stuff by hand. Instead, Passport is making it very easy for us. This means, let me just to say it again, anywhere in my application where I have routes, so in my posts, in my users, in my comments, anywhere else, I can now access a request.user. 
And if a person's logged in, that's going to be an actual database user from my application. And if a person is not logged in, then it's going to be undefined or false, or you know, evalu basically evaluate to false. And what's nice about that is because this is an actual user in my database, I'm tracking whether that user is, and is an administrator. Right? So I could actually just go ahead and log request.user.admin as well. My server. Log in again. My console. There's my user, and there's the fact that I am not an administrator in the database, which is ultimately what I want to check. Right? We are now set up to manage access, the third part of sort of controlling resources on our website, uh, thanks to Passport providing all of this session control for us. So we've got the first part, authentication. We're signing a user in. We're checking their email address. We've got the second part tracking that user across multiple HTTP requests anytime they go anywhere in my site now, as long as they've logged in and that cookie doesn't expire. So we're tracking. Now that I have access to this object, I can control. Um, now that I have this object available, I can control access to resources on my site by whether the person is logged in and if they're an administrator. So let's do that. Um, any questions about where we're at so far, though? Does this make sense? Yeah. I think it's helpful knowing what's going on under the hood, which is why Waylon lecture was a great was a great addition. Okay. All right. So let's control access. Simplest thing I could do here. Uh, well, first of all, where do we want to control access to? Certain pages. Certain pages. Which ones? Post pages for new. Yeah, we want to control access to get new. That's a, let's just start there, in fact. Ultimately, we need to control access to any of the pages that make any modifications to the data, right? That would be get new, post to the index, get uh, edit, put to the particular post, and delete, right? Ultimately, we got to control access to all of those. But let's start with new. Simplest thing I could do here in get new is check if the user is logged in. So request.user and request.user is an admin. And then if they are, I could let them do this. If they're not, the way I would write that is I would say if not request.user or not an admin, redirect to the login page. So I could do response.redirect user is logged and then maybe I could also flash the message and say, danger, danger, Will Robinson, you must first log in. I do something as simple as that. Now I am controlling access to this part of my site. And then I could say, otherwise, the user start to create a new post. Does that make sense? I think that's pretty straightforward. I'm just seeing if they're logged in, and I'm just seeing if they're an administrator. I'll restart my server. I'm going to go to log in. I'm going to go to create a new post. I need to log in because I'm not an administrator. My admin value is false in the data distinguishing between the fact that I'm logged in or not an administrator. But if I fire up my Mongo client, use my blog database, and go db.users.find, see that fill at fill .net is right there. This is my object ID. I'm going to update that item in my database. It's ID. And I am going to change the admin value to Mongo syntax is very strange. Sit. I think that's right. Okay. Now if I do db.users.find, I'll see that Phil Dow is in fact an administrator. Let's go log in again. Although that actually wouldn't be necessary. And let's go to create a new post. 
now I have access to it. This is like the rudiment, rudimentary access control. Does this person, is this person an administrator? Is this visitor logged in? Let them get to this page. Yep. Uh, a lot of that would take place under the hood though, right? With cookies or no? All of this is taking place underneath the hood with okay, cookies. So yeah. we aren't, uh, I mean, but we could manually. Could manually do all this, yeah. Who, who the administrator is at least. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to do that at some point in the database. The cookie is totally indifferent to whether they're an administrator or not. All the cookie does is tell us what user they are. Right. It's then our responsibility to look that user up and see if they're an admin or see if they're just a normal user or see if they're a moderator or whatever, right? How's the object ID generated in that case uh, for the administrator? Uh, I had to do that. So we signed up, right? So when I signed up, I signed up as fill at filled out I went to users sign up. Users sign up. And if I look at my mongoose user object, we had told that default is false. That's why I just manually went into the database like this and okay. changed it to true. Yeah, we had to do that. So if you've ever used WordPress, have you ever set up a WordPress blog like from from scratch, from zero, installed it in a new place, and you go to like set up your WordPress and you run that WPP configure, mm -hmm. and it asks you to give you that first user? It sets that first user's value admin to true or however it's doing underneath the hood. But then you delete that file so nobody else can do it. And now any other user that signs up is not an administrator, right? Okay. So you could, I mean, you can implement it however you want, yeah? But that's a separate issue. That's an application issue separate from the fact that a cookie is being passed back and forth. It all happens between the database and your server. So this is, this is really a hack. This is not really how you want to do it. I just need to demonstrate that I can make me an administrator, right? Okay, so uh, the Passport module that we're using provides a number of methods on this request object, this req. We've seen that there's a login method. We've seen that we have now have this access to a request.user. There's also a logout method, request.logout. And finally, there's an isAuthenticated method that not only checks to see if request.user is set, but also checks to see if Passport is actually being used. Um, and I prefer, excuse me, <laughs> that was a burp, that was a, that was a burp. Uh, and I prefer uh, to use that abstraction. So rather than checking this user object directly, what I really want to do is call the express, uh, the Passport method is authenticated, okay? Again, how do I know that that exists? I look at uh, the, uh, the Passport documentation, which I keep on wanting to call express, and somewhere in here, this uh, method exists. Actually, they don't mention the fact that it exists. That's why I was disappointed with this documentation. I found that in example code somewhere else. But we can see that there's this like request.login method, right? As well as a request.logout method, which we're going to take advantage of. So all I've done here is changed it from checking if the user is set directly to checking for is authenticated. The bigger change that I want to make. Okay. I need to control access to like five different routes in this file. I need to control access to my git new. I need to control access to the post. I need to control access to the git edit. I need to control access to the put. And then finally, I need to control access to the delete. How am I going to do that? Am I going to copy and paste this bit of code right here into all of those functions? Yeah, so because that would be a bad idea. I don't want to copy and paste five times. We want to follow this principle known as dry, which I mentioned before, do not re uh, which means your code should have one canonical implementation for some piece of behavior, and then your application will call that behavior by way of a function. So I'm going to take this out here. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to go, no. I'm going to copy it for now, in fact. Now I'm going to create my own function in this file. So I'm just adding a function literally at the bottom of my router before I export. And I'm going to call it function is admin. And it is going to take, if I remember, probably just, uh, I think it actually needs to take the whole request object. Yeah. And maybe even response. Yeah. So I'm going to take, we're going to see why in a sec. This will be a little stranger. I'm going to take the request object. I'm going to take the response object as well. And I'm going to take a next 
which suggests that what am I setting up is admin to be? Where have we seen request response and next before? In middleware, in middleware right? I'm actually going to write a middleware function, not just a normal function that my code is going to call. I'm going to write middleware that I'm going to insert into each one of these routes independently. Yeah? I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. I think it's pretty cool that that works. But for now, I can have this code that I just had in there. Exact same thing, right? Is this request authenticated? Is this person on the request an administrator? If not, let's redirect to login with a danger message. I could say, you must first log in, not an admin, or whatever. Otherwise, I'm just going to call next, which will hand it off to the next bit of code inside of this like chain of handlers. Yeah. Now, where can I put this function? I think this is what's crazy. I just discovered this when I was preparing this lesson. Here I'm manually checking this, right? Let's get rid of that. Let's reduce this function back to its essence, whose responsibility is to create a blank new post and just render it. That's really all this function should care about, but we want to control access to it. I can, this function, and this function alone, no other function, to have an extra bit of middleware. Normally, I put my middleware in this app.js file with all this app.use stuff. This is all middleware. And it applies globally to all of my functions. But I can apply middleware to a specific function by placing it in between the URL that is matching and my function callback that is being called. So I'm literally going to tell this router.git that is admin is an additional piece of middleware that I want you to call between the fact that this got matched and my code is going to run, right? And notice I don't call is admin. I'm not doing this. I am providing it to router.git, and this function, router.git, at some point underneath the hood, will call it for me, right? And then my code will go down here, check to see if they're authenticated. If they're not, it will handle the request itself, which middleware can do. If they are, it's going to call next. And next simply says, hey, go to the next thing in line, which is my function callback, my normal route handler. Right? I think that's pretty awesome. Let's save that. Make sure I didn't do anything completely incorrect here. It's totally possible. But I should be able to go to posts.new, and it will say I'm not. Uh, oh, oh, something went wrong. I was new. It should have seen that I was uh, not an administrator. Uh, but I'm not logged in, so my session should be dead. Mu is admin. If not request is authenticated. Log admin. Something's wrong. This is you know this is a. Uh, Checking admin. Maybe I just had to uh, refresh something. Can you save that? Yeah, maybe I didn't save it or something. Oh, that's probably the guess, because that should have worked. Let's try it one more time. Login. That's fine. Yeah, there we go. So probably I just didn't save the page. Right. It sees that it, so that middleware is running, right? In between the user's new, or post new and my application code that actually shows me that form is admin gets run sees that I'm not logged in and says, hey, sign in. So I go and sign in. Now I can go to post.new. The same check happens, except for now I'm an administrator. And this lovely little isAdmin function that we've inserted in between a router.git new and this guy, I can now add to all of those functions that require administrator access which is way better than copying and pasting the implementation all over the place. So that now, anywhere that I go, I have to be logged in to deal with that post. Let me not log in just to show that that's necessary. So if I go to give it a title and I go to delete, I'm not an admin. If I go to a post and go to edit it, I'm not an admin. But once I've logged in, I guess it redirected me to logging in. 
Now I go to edit, no problem. And now I go to create, no problem. And if I wanted to delete it, which I'm not, it would work fine, right? And not only that, but if I were to bypass this form and use you know, some other service to post directly to my server rather than getting the form first, it's still going to reject that possibility because the user is not signed in and doesn't have a cookie. Yeah. So I've just secured access to modifying my posts by adding that one authentication, two session management, and three access control right? with this bit of code. Any questions about how that works? Other than like, actually, how do we, how do I do that again? <laughs> I think again, more importantly, we have a specific way of implementing it, and we're using Flash, and we're using Express, and we're using, you know, cookies and sessions. Uh, but more importantly, is this process? Yeah, it does not matter what kind of web application you build, what language you build it in, or what framework you use. If you want to deal with users you have to have authentication, whatever it is, User, username and password, Twitter, Facebook. You must have some kind of authentication uh, that identifies that person, right? That establishes trust for that person's identity. You know their password, you're that person. Two, you must have cookies and sessions. Otherwise, you can't tell that a user that just logged in is also making a request to a new page. And then three, you need to have some kind of access control. What level of privilege does a user need given that you trust them because they know that user's password, what level of permission does that user need to access certain portions of your site? Those are the three things that must be implemented for this to work. So, um, there's, uh, Let's uh, do a couple of things real quick, and then we'll wrap it up here. Right now, I'm not actually logging out, right? So I can edit posts. What if I went to users log out? Go, great, hey, you're logged out. Therefore, actually didn't uh, log me out. Actually, it shouldn't have logged me out. Did I restart my server? I don't think I restarted my server. That'd be funny. Users log out, just flushes and redirects. Weird. Shouldn't be logging me out. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> yeah, but it shouldn't be. Because <laughs> I actually have to call that somewhere. So I'm logged in. I can go to create a new post. If I go to users... Log out. I go to create a new post. Right, I can still create a new post. I'm not exactly sure what happened there, even though I logged out. Right, so you go, no, 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 no. Seriously, I wanted to log out. Okay, I'm logged out. Great. <laughs> no, I can still create a new post. Why? I have not deleted that session. That session that is associated with this browser in my server. And again, we can do this uh, thing that Waylon was showing us, where like we actually look at the cookies. I don't remember where that is in here. Resources, cookies associated with this site. There it is right there. It's still in there. Until that thing is gone, I am not actually logged out. Yeah? Until that thing is deleted. How do I delete that? Well, request provides a logout method on the response object, on the request object, excuse me, uh, that I can just call. So uh, down here where I say... Uh, I want to log out. Before I flash the message and before I redirect, I want to say request.logout. That's something that Passport provides. Passport, again, makes that available on the request object. Now, I'm restarting my server. I'm not logged in, obviously, but look at that. I've got some kind of cookie thing going on there. That's probably not valid. I didn't delete it. Let's delete that. This thing is unrelated. Refresh it. Go to, I guess, oh yeah, uh, it always sets a cookie. There's just no user ID associated with it. Login. Now this thing has a user ID associated with it somehow magically. And go to new post. Fantastic. But if I log out, I'm actually logged out, and this cookie will have been changed to not contain my ID anymore. So if I try to go to new post, I'm no longer logged in. Right? Just by calling that logout message. But what's happening underneath the hood is this connect.sid value is changing here. And Passport is managing that for us, right? Wayland showed us that we can deal with these things directly if we want to. What I'm showing you is the abstraction on top of that. So much of programming is about adding easy abstractions. The abstraction on top of that that deals with that for us so that I can just worry about users and access control, right? Not the low-level stuff. So logging out is really easy. Uh, the last thing I want to show you, this is annoying. So I'm going to restart my server. 
I'm going to go to posts. So you know what? I want to make a new post. I'm going to go to new post. I have to log in. Okay, fine. I know I have to log in. It takes me back to the posts index. Really, I want to go back to this new post page. I want to go directly back to the page I came from. Uh, similarly, I'm going to log out, uh, log out here. If I wanted to go to a particular post and edit that post, I go, okay, I need to log in. Still taking me back to the post index when I should be I should be returning to that edit form, right? How am I going to implement that? Right now, I'm hard coding this redirect when I successfully log in. If I look at my users and I look at my login, post login right there, and it's successful, I always redirect to posts. How am I going to fix this? How can I set it up so that I get redirected back to the page that I came from? without hard coding anything. What are the facts? Yeah, this is in there, so let's like let's let's brainstorm this a little bit. This is going to have to be variable. We know that whatever this is is going to have to change. It's going to be if it's going to be different depending on the page that I just visited, right? So somehow this thing right here, this request needs to know about a previous request. How do we make a connection between one request and another request? No, no. It's just, it's these guys here. We'll, we'll have an if statement here in a second. But ultimately, the only way to make information move from one request to another request is with a cookie. We need to set some additional piece of data that will let this request know that it came from another request. So you would just store that information in a variable? That's right. We're just going to store that information in a cookie specifically. The cookie will be the variable. And then in JavaScript, we'll use an if statement to see if a cookie is set for the last page that was visited, get its value, which we can just make the last page that was visited. And if it is, redirect to that. If it's not, redirect to wherever we want. Right? How do I set cookies myself? Well, um, uh, we have the request.session variable. So this request object that we have everywhere now also has a session variable to, uh, associated with it that is provided by the session middleware um, that is being set up right there. When we say app.use session whatever, we get access to a request.session variable that we can set and then um, use from other parts of our application. So what I really want to do is go in here, hey, sorry, right here, if I successfully logged in, everything worked great, if some piece of data exists, redirect to that piece of data. I don't know what it is yet. Otherwise, and we'll keep the flash the same in both cases, otherwise, just go to posts or wherever, right? The question is, what is this piece of data right here? What is this missing bit of data right here? Well, It'll be the cookie. So, so, so the really trick is, what in request gives us access to it? It's going to be this request.session object. And this is a JavaScript object that we can assign multiple values to. So I can just assign some variable to this thing. Or really, here I'm not assigning, I'm getting. But it's, I'm choosing the name I want to use. The name I'm going to use because it makes sense to me, is redirect. So this is presuming, this is totally arbitrary. I can make this anything I want. Let's make it foo so that that's clear. Foo, right? I can make this anything I want. Now, somewhere in my application, I have to set request.session.foo to be equal to the last URL that I just came from so that I can redirect to it. The value of request.session.foo will be some URL. Where do I set request.session.foo to that URL? Does everybody know what I'm asking? So. Somewhere I just came, so it's like I visited new posts, right? So I go to new post. I got redirected to this page. 
when did I get redirected to this page? I'm actually redirected to this page from trying to go to new post. I don't go directly to user's login. I go to new post first. The middleware. The middleware is responsible for the redirect. And before that redirect occurs, I need to track the last page that I was on, the page that I was on before the redirect happens. And that takes place in one location, the is admin middleware that we just wrote. This is where I redirect. So before I redirect, I should set request.session.foo variable to whatever URL I'm originally coming from, right? Which in this case would be posts new. How do I know what that original URL is? The request object knows what the original URL is. Original URL is the original URL. I have to. Look, I looked up at the. You know, if you look at the Express documentation, you'll see that the value of original URL contains the location uh, that you're coming from in the request. So, so now I'm setting that to the session. I'm getting it in user. I'm calling the redirect. I should also delete it when I'm finished, so it doesn't hang around. Because I'm actually. What is this doing? What is request.session.foo, when I set something to that, what is that doing? It's actually creating cookies. It's actually adding data to the cookies. That's what's happening underneath the hood, right? And that is just going to stay around until I get rid of it. So I need to manually delete it when I'm finished with it. And I'm finished with it after I logged in, right? So I can say delete, which is a JavaScript keyword, request.session.foo. So now, I restart my server. Go to users, or sorry, posts new. Sure enough, that's what I should get. Let's go to posts that we can see that redirect explicitly. Okay, new post redirects me to log in. I'm going to log in. Send me immediately back to the new post. Exactly what I wanted. I could sign out, uh, log out, I suppose. Okay. Now I'm going to go to edit the magic of strace. I need to log in. And it's going to send me back to editing the magic of strace. But underneath the hood, this guy has been modified to contain that information. At this point, I guess it's deleted because we're already logged in. But in between that happening, this thing is being modified so that it contains that original URL. We get that accomplished with two lines of code. Yeah, request.session.whatever equals. This thing gets changed. Then we go to some other page. We check request.session, and then we delete it. Right? And that whole, just that, just those, I guess, three lines of code right there is making a massive change to the information that is passing back and forth between the browser and the server. But we get this abstraction. We just have to call a line of code to make that happen. And that's how you would implement that. So. Um, it's all, I mean, it's all in here. So, uh, but I set it up in this admin function. I say request.session.foo equals whatever, our original URL. And then I check for it after the user successfully logs in. So find one, no error. Uh, password and stuff is good. Log them in using passport, no error, success, flash, and then check if session.foo is set. There's some other niceties that we might want to implement. So uh, our, fun our application does not remember me. So if I were to like uh, go away for you know five days and then come back, some sites just automatically log you in. This one will not. I have to implement something that does that. Right now, whenever I restart my application, like that, this cookie is still there. The cookie is still in the browser, right? This this thing still exists and is still going to get sent to the server. I guess it doesn't here. Um, although I don't know why. That should still be there, I would think. Um, uh, oh, no, I guess it's not. Uh, no, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the cookie should still somehow be around because I haven't explicitly deleted it, but it's not associated with a session anymore because the session is stored in memory. right? And so every time I restart my server, all of that information gets lost. I'm using an in-memory session. Uh, Waylon mentioned that you might use a database to store that stuff, like Redis or Mongo. In that case, I can restart my server as many times as you want. All of that cookie user association is still going to be over in my database. And when my server starts up again, it's just going to talk to the database. And my database never went down. My database goes down, then I lose the information. But 
So there's all other, there's a bunch of little niceties that you can add to this, but the basic idea here um, is how do we use cookies and sessions inside of a node application to handle user management so that we can control access to particular resources. Time to get drunk. <laughs> I like I actually don't drink that much. So but I'm gonna go sit in the sauna. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drive right to the Y. Yeah. Wait a minute before you depart. Um just right. on uh, the uh, client side, JavaScript right. tools. Just point us in the direction. jQuery. jQuery. Only place you need to go. That's not entirely true. My own might have some additional information. Underscore is another excellent one. So uh, there's a couple of things that so the couple of things you want to know, jQuery. Everybody is using jQuery or some, de, no, I don't want to say derivative, but thing that works like jQuery, like Zepto, right? It's like jQuery. Uh, lets you very easily manipulate a web page dynamically without having to go back to the server, right? So I can like I can click on something in my web page and it'll make something slide out, or whatever, jQuery. Um, or Zepto or a similar uh, uh, similar service, and it's uh, jQuery.org, I believe. So, yeah, there are some utility methods provided by a library, another library called Underscore, which is really awesome. These are functional methods, and so these are all uh, very often methods that take uh, callbacks, and then we have to write in our callback what we wanted to do. Remember when we implemented for each and map and these kinds of functions? Underscore provides these and we can use them in the client. Now this is really s simple, basic, browser-side JavaScript, right? Just moving things around, making stuff happen. There are full JavaScript frameworks, like Express for the server, that handle all of, or a lot of what we're doing, all of the view rendering, all of the data management, all of that stuff inside of the browser instead of on the server. So we would write server code that really only authenticates users and communicates with a database, but doesn't render any HTML. We would never use that render function, right? Response to render. Instead, we would just get information from the database, send it to the browser, and this, this browser framework would use that raw data and change the web page itself, right? These are called single page applications. You have one page on your entire application. There's no like going to multiple URLs. There's one page. You trick the browser into thinking you're going to multiple URLs, but then it's a JavaScript inside the browser that sees that, asks for just the data from the server, and then dynamically updates the page when it gets that data. Frameworks like this are Backbone, which is similar to underscore.js. They use underscore.js. I don't know what Backyard is. Oh, I know what backyard is. That's the thing that you showed me. Uh, back, it's the uh, uh, backbone. Sorry, backbone JS. So this guy right here. This is sort of like one of the original, like big client side frameworks that handles all. It. Like you have to relearn routing, modeling, and views. MVC, the whole thing in the browser. Uh, Angular and Ember are two others that are very popular right now. So there's Angular JS. This guy which uh, makes it easy to do all that stuff on, this, on the client. And then Ember.js is another one that is very popular right now as well. And literally, it's like we're, gonna, we're taking all of this view stuff that we're doing in our server, all of this routing stuff that we're doing in our server, and moving it to the browser. And then our server just becomes responsible for, our, for getting data from the database and sending it to the browser. Everything else happens in here. So there's a big push in that direction. Um, we went this direction where we uh, did all of our stuff using the server because these things are, I think, in my, are a little bit harder maybe. Um, and then uh, if you go to another web framework, so like a PHP framework or um, a, a, a Python and Django framework or Ruby on Rails framework, you'll see the stuff that we've learned with Node used in all of those. So you now have like all of the theory that you would need to try out another programming language and another framework in that language. Um, whereas if we had learned this stuff, you'd be missing that. Yeah. So that's not to say anything's wrong with these. I think um, I, I've used Backbone myself, so we just, we just went that route. So yeah, those would be the those would be the things to look at. What is a varnish? What is what? Varnish. 
Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. Programming language. Varnish? A. How do you spell it? Varnish. Like varnish. Yeah, R N I S H. <laughs> varnish. Yeah. I thought you were saying varnish. I have no idea what varnish is. Next website supply. I don't know. Do you know what squid is? Uh, no, it's just a one up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what this is. So, yeah. There's, I mean, so, I mean, I'm from my, my world almost certainly knows more about this stuff than I do. It's, it's insane the tools that people are developing for web development right now. If you want to learn iOS development, <coughs> really you go learn Objective C and the frameworks that Apple provides. If you want to learn Android development, you go learn Java and the frameworks that Google provides. Um, if you want to learn web development, roll the dice. <laughs> like, there's so many options, it's insane, right? Yeah, Brent. Uh, well, Swift will be the future, so, right. So at some point, we're all going to have to learn Swift. But then at that point, you only learn Swift, right? There's not, I don't need to learn JavaScript and HTML and CSS and Ember and, and Backbone and and then also Node and then also Mongo and then also how to use Express and Passport. I learn Swift, and I learn Apple's frameworks. I don't even have to choose. Apple's like, here's what you learn. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's just, that's not to say that one or the other is better. Uh, I, would I, would, I would suggest that most of the innovation right now happening in development is happening in web development. So Let me just say it's, uh, it speeds up your website. Speeds up your website. So varnish. Yeah, there's tons more we can. We didn't learn about any of the operational stuff. There's all kinds of cool things. We stopped deploying to Heroku, notice. That will not happen in the next class. Uh, there's some additional setup work that you got to do to make it uh, work with a Mongo database on Heroku. It's not even that much. We just... Never had time for it. Uh, so, th and that's called operations. There's this operational stuff, getting your code into the real world. Tons that you can learn about that as well. So, and then the combination of developer or developing and operations is known as DevOps, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So, knowing how to do all that. Right? <coughs> you want to add anything? I miss you guys. <laughs> we'll have some kind of get together or something next week maybe or in a couple of weeks we could do hackathons I mean I, I want to do hackathons anyway I know my world lights up as soon as they're like yeah dude let's do some hackathons I told so, you how to place if you want to do hackathons so sweet yeah oh is this in stuff yeah it's open so, so you get together get a bunch of junk food and really caffeinated beverages and like stay up all night coding like <laughs> 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 I know, right? <laughs> we talked about the Tulsa conference coming up. Yeah, uh, you want to mention it? I uh, just uh, there's a, uh, a Tulsa developers conference. Uh, you have to register. Just do a Google search for the Tulsa 